Let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation. As you're turning there, what a mouthful. I mean, let me read this title to you. Jesus, money, stewardship, rewards, and eternity. Now that's enough. But the tagline, what is God's desire for us Laodicean age believers? Now, just to catch you up, we're going through Revelation. Uh, we are, are going into chapter 6. Chapter 6 is about how the world's going to end. And the best way to know how to live today is to know the ending. And so we step back for Peter's wise words. And what he said is, since you know everything's going to dissolve, it's all going to end, how should you live today? And so that's, that's what got us into uh, this run-up preparing for chapter 6 of Revelation. And so over the past six weeks, we've looked at how Christ's words about the dangers of living for material things. Remember, Peter heard that a few weeks ago. I, I shared with you how he had stood there and for the first time heard Jesus addressing materialism and how that never left him. It, it stayed with him to the end of his life. In fact, the very last chapter of his life, 2 Peter 3, he leaves us these words, and I call them Peter's lessons on the end of the world, materialism, contentment, and the uncluttered life. And Peter really had that. He had an uncluttered life. He was able to be doing whatever the Lord wanted him to do. He traveled, he ministered to churches, he was here. He went as far, church history says, as Babylon, Iraq. And, and he went to the Jewish, there was a huge contingent of Jews out there, and ended up in Rome, and as you know, was crucified upside down. But the lessons of Peter's last chapter are dwarfed by today's lessons, because Peter was only giving us kind of the, the allusions to what Christ taught him. But this morning, I'd like to go back to the source, because not only were Peter's last chapters about materialism, Christ's last letter to us is all about materialism. Jesus wrote seven little letters, postcards, short messages to seven geographically identifiable local bodies of Christ in the first century. It's interesting, the order in which he wrote them not only followed a geographic route of how the rivers would go and how the, the roads would be, but also they seem to beautifully portray the successive ages of church history. Now, it means a lot to me because all of my PhD work was in church history. And when I read those, I can see the succeeding eras of the history of Christ's church that we're a part of. But what's interesting, no matter what interpretational model you follow, Laodicea is the last one. It's the last one before we get into what the Bible describes as the Great Tribulation. So no matter where, what perspective you come from, there were seven churches, but Jesus invested heavily his message about materialism to the last church. And if it is succeeding ages, we're very clearly in that last one. And we are very clearly in a world that is getting more and more consumed with material things. And so Jesus, in Revelation 3, and if you uh, haven't opened there yet, look at verse 14 of chapter 3 onward, we find Christ's last words to his last church written down in this letter. So the last church he's going to write to is this church we're looking at. And the theme of this final letter is very pointedly, it's not an illusion, it's pointed at materialism in the heart of this church. Peter alluded to what Jesus taught him about materialism in 2 Peter 3, but in Revelation 3, Jesus point blank condemns materialism in any form in the church. Now, you say, what about in the world? That's chapter 18 of Revelation. There's a whole chapter devoted to the dissolution of all of the material pursuits of every person on this planet. And I don't know if we'll live so long as to ever make it to chapter 18, but it's coming down there in Revelation. But this chapter ends with these words as Jesus... Now, now here, I could summarize verses 14 through 22 with this title. Materialism in believers makes Jesus nauseous. Have you ever been around something that made you nauseated? Uh, we drove all the way to Chicago in the, in the snow on Tuesday and drove all the way back in the 
warm, sunny weather on Friday, and we were, uh, Jeremy and Jess and I were just talking, and we were all telling stories, and, and uh, they wanted to hear a story from the old days, so I told them one. And uh, I told them about how I paid my way through college, because um, I had to pay my way through college, and I used to sell my blood, not to the uh, Red Cross, I sold it to the plasma place, you know, the one where they suck it out of you, do something to it, and put it back in. And it goes out red and comes back clear. So you gave something, the red part, I guess. And so I, I would sit in this huge room. It looked like a furniture store with all these reclining chairs. And I'd get paid $30 to sit there for a half hour, I mean a dollar a minute, to study. I mean, I thought it was just better than sliced bread. So I'd go as often as they'd let me, and I'd get in my little chair and lay out my arm and get my books all set up, and I'd be studying there, and I never really paid any attention. You know, they'd poke me and it hurt a little bit, and they'd have this little bag there, and they'd be drawing it out, and, and then they'd come back and after a while and put a little clear bag up and poke it back in, and I'd keep studying. And I'd gone through the, I don't know how many, in fact, I did it so many times that whenever I go to the doctor's office now, I have a new nurse, she'll look at me and say, were you an intravenous drug addict? <laughs> because I'm so scarred. All of my, because I mean, I was just poked everywhere. But, so I was just sitting there studying, and they put the bag up, and I didn't pay any attention to it, and they poked it in, and not one second after they poked it in, the most intense, burning, sizzling, felt like hot wax, hot water, fire, just started radiating out. And within two seconds, I was yelling. And boy, they came running back and pulled that needle out, and she looked at my wrist and looked at the bag and looked at the wrist and said, oh, sorry wrong bag. And they had put somebody else's blood into me. And boy, I never went back there again. Uh, I took my $30. I should have sued them, you know, their socks off, but they didn't do that back then. But you know what? I was right in the middle of telling my great story when I heard a little groan from the back seat. And one of the men in the back seat was going like this and said, oh, blood, and talking about that is making me get sick. You know, don't tell anymore. You know, you're going to have to pull over. And I thought, Different things nauseate us. You know what nauseates Jesus Christ? It's right here. Materialism in the life of a believer makes Jesus nauseated. Revelation 3, let, let's read about it because it's a very, very powerful passage. Revelation 3, we'll start in 14, go to the end of the chapter. Let's stand together, and as we stand, we're inviting the Lord to speak to our hearts. This is, this is the part of our time together where we're hearing directly from God. It, it's unadulterated truth directly. When you hear or read or are in the Word, you're getting, you're getting pure Word from God. Listen to what he says. Verse 14, chapter 3, Revelation. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, to him will I grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's bow together. Father, we know already from your word that every one of us here who are born again, in that miraculous work of salvation, received ears to hear. You gave us 
the ability to hear your voice and to respond and to follow you. And that's why the the evidence of salvation is that not only do we long and hunger and thirst after your word, but when we're in it, we actually know that you are speaking to us. And we are your sheep, and we hear your voice, and we know you, and we follow you. And so you've said that if we're believers, we'll hear the warning of what you just said. And I pray that by your Spirit we would, as individuals, that we would hear what nauseates you, and that we would collectively, as a church, be sure that we are responding to what you have said to us. And we'll thank you and pray that you be exalted as we respond. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, it's interesting. I was thinking all week long about Jesus being sick and nauseated. And I thought, you know, in Matthew 23, Jesus confronts religious hypocrisy with the most caustic, uh, just, just cutting words of his ministry. In fact, the, the most verbal assault Jesus ever delivered in all of his 89 chapters of the gospel is in Matthew 23. And it was because of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So Jesus is really vehemently, verbally opposed to, to religious hypocrisy. And then I thought, you know, a little later uh, in the Gospels, in John chapter 2, Jesus didn't just verbally, uh, he got so violently angry that, that his actions were just off the charts. Do you remember the cleaning, of the cleaning out of the temple and the cord, the whip he made, and how he drove out the money changers and he drove out the people that were buying and selling the, the livestock? And so Jesus just, just, just violently responded to that, that defilement to worship. And Jesus just vehemently denounced religious hypocrisy. But what's interesting uh, those never say anything in those passages that he got sick, that it, that it made him sick. In fact, here in Revelation 3, something happens that's not in any of the other 1188 other chapters of the Bible. Jesus tells us that, that there's something in his life. We've already seen him moved with compassion. That's his most frequent emotion. We've seen him wearied by ministry. We've seen him angry at those whitewashed hypocrites and religious leaders. We've seen him violently driving out money changers and livestock sellers. But we've never seen Jesus get sick before. I mean, not even a little sick. Not even saying he didn't, you know, feel healthy. Never. And so... I I call this when Jesus gets, you know, the flu bug or a little touch of the flu. What is it that that makes Jesus get something that most of us know uh, much too well? And and that is being sick. And and even as verse 16 says, vomiting. Well, in the 89 chapters of the Gospels, we see Jesus tired. We see Jesus sorrowful and quiet. We see him dynamically teaching. We see him reflectively, kindly, tenderly engaging people. We see him receptive to people's needs. We see him prayerful, and we even see him troubled. But never, no matter what he faced in all of his earthly ministry, we never saw Jesus thickened by anything. Now, think about what he faced. Jesus was face to face with demons who are vile, unclean, eternal spirits that rebelled against him. And Jesus doesn't get sick, seeing demons. Jesus goes face to face with Satan himself, doesn't get sick. Jesus even touches the rotted flesh of lepers. Now on that one I have to pause. I remember once uh, when I was teaching in India, I was being ferried between one school where I taught and a church I was going, and one of those little things you ride in India, it's like an oversized bicycle, and, and just, there's just people and cows and everything milling around. And a beggar must have seen that I was a Westerner, and he ran over and put his stump right in the window of my little thing I was riding in. And for the first time, he didn't have a hand, it was gone, it was just a stump, and it was, it was my first time ever seeing up close the, the decay of the human body that, that 
leprosy and sickness causes. And it just uh, uh, ruined the rest of my days eating. It was most over, but I didn't touch him. I just saw it sticking in the window. Jesus touched the rotting flesh of lepers. And it didn't make him sick. He even would touch feverish brows of dying women. He even grasped the cold, lifeless hand of the corpse of a dead child. But none of that sin or suffering or defilement ever made him sick. As far as we know. Right here in verse 16 at the end in verse 17. It's the only thing in the universe that sickens the holy, harmless, undefiled Savior of the world, the creator of the universe, and our risen good shepherd. And the only one thing that makes him nauseous is when he sees believers who he bought and redeemed and outright purchased completely for life and eternity. When he sees them loving longing, caring, sacrificing for money and possessions and pushing him out of the way. See, that's exactly what had happened in Laodicea. And look what it says in, in verse 17. This is why I'm sick. This is why Jesus is at the point of nausea-induced vomit. It's believers who declare Christ by the choices of their lives and words is not as important as their stuff. And he says, because you say, verse 17, I am rich. By the way, the word rich is thesarizo, it means to stack. And it's when those believers could say, wow, I have stacked enough stuff that I don't have any financial worries because I have a lot stacked up. I've got it stacked up for rainy days and stormy days and whatever days. I am ready. I am rich. I've stacked. I have so much stuff that I can stack it and have become wealthy, which is just a synonym of stacking. And this is the result. I have need of nothing. And you know what's included in the nothing? The Lord. That's what made him sick. Materialism can bring us to the point where we don't really need the Lord. Now, do you remember Jesus left a prayer that's supposed to be a, a pattern, a framework for us for every day of our life? Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, after this manner, therefore pray ye, and the pray ye is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a requirement of us as believers that we have this framework in our lives. It starts with our Father in heaven and hallowing his name and his kingdom come and his will being done. And what's the middle of the seven requests? Right dead center, three and three, all about the Lord. But right in the middle is the only one that has to do with us. And you know what it says? Give us this day a lifetime of bread. Is, do you all know that prayer? Is that what it says? No, no. It doesn't say, give me all I need for life. Give me this day my what? Daily. Why? Why is that supposed to be a part of every day's spiritual communion with the Lord? It's because the Lord does not want independence. It's a mantra of our culture independence, especially financial independence. Don't let those corporations push you around. Get financially independent. And God says, watch out. I want you totally dependent on me for daily bread, knowing you can't make it without me. Did you know our culture makes us think we can make it for a long time? And the Lord says, no, that sickens me. You do not know in this independence and needing nothing, you don't know that you are wretched. That word wretched in your Bible in verse 17 is a fascinating word. It's made from two words. It's, it's the word talent, you know, talent, like the one talent, five talents, and ten talents, the Jesus parable. It's the word talent put together with another word, pyros. And talent is just a weight. It's, they would get a scales and they would weigh things out in a certain weight as a talent. And it was 60 pounds in one period of time and 100 in another. So it's a heavyweight. The word pyros means to be pierced. And you know, when you put those two words together, wretched means that something heavily is piercing your life. And he says, and that's what's happened with your riches. In fact, you know, I think in pictures, do you know what I see? 
I'm, I'm back in India. You ever seen the holy men in India and their festivals and everything? They just did it, you know, in the Ganges. They all, 120 million people washed away their sins this weekend in the Ganges, if it's possible. They did it. But part of the whole thing over there in, in Hinduism is that they will have these holy men parading in front of them. And these holy men are wearing nothing but a little cloth wrapped around their middle, and they have giant hooks that are placed in their back into their skin, and they have a sled behind them, and they strain along, pulling the sled with its stretch. I mean, you talk about nauseating, watching that. It's, not, it's stretching their skin, and they're bleeding, and they're dragging these sleds along, and that's exactly the word Jesus uses. Only it's not a Hindu loss, you know, denying the true and living God. It's the church, and we're straining through life pierced and miserable because we're dragging all the stuff that the Lord gave us for him and we're hoarding it and we're we're not giving it out as we go through life we're dragging it through life and telling everybody to stay away from our sled of stuff and Jesus said you know how it makes me sick to see you wretched miserable that means to be squashed and that's what happens to having too much stuff you get squashed by a poor Spiritually, we're paupers, blind. That, that word blind in verse 17 is fascinating. It, it's the word that's used for your eyes getting opaque. I remember we had a staff member in Tulsa that uh, he had had a very great career in, in dentistry, and he came on staff at the church, and he worked with us every day. He just was a marvelous servant of the Lord. And I remember a couple of years of his tenure with us that he used to complain about how dark it was in the church, and, and he would say that, that the overheads just looked not very professional anymore, and, and he talked about the painting and said everything needed painting. And finally, his wife uh, noted to him that, that he was getting cataracts. And so after a little talk and they set up the appointment and he got, you know, got those things worked on, he came back and he'd go, oh, look at how yellow those pencils are. Oh, look at that. And he just, everything came alive in color because his eyes had become opaque. The word also means smoky, where you can't see clearly because you're obscured. And Jesus said, dragging your sled not only is piercing you through, and, and it's making you wretched, and it's making you miserable, and it's making you impoverished. But he says, when you're doing that, you can't see me. They're mutually exclusive, and you're naked. In other words, you don't have the garments of righteousness, of your personal works you were created to do for my glory. You're not doing those. You were created for good deeds, and you're not doing them. Well, basically, the conclusion is loving Jesus means avoiding anything nauseous to him. And as soon as the little voice in the back seat went, mm, don't talk anymore about the, you know, I stopped. Now, if I didn't love him, you know what I would have done? I would have said, well, I ought to tell you about another one. I remember when I, you know, fell down and cut my arm all the way down, and boy, it laid open, and then he would have fallen out the window. But if you love someone, you don't do what nauseates them. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I'm telling you, materialism in believers makes me sick. So you know what response every one of us should have? I don't want to make you sick in any way. So what do you want me to do? How can I avoid that? How can I avoid anything nauseous to you? You know, Jesus warned the believers at Laodicea to be very cautious about money and possessions because possessions had distracted those early believers from why they were even left here on earth. I mean, this church is not doing anything that, that Christ left them to do. They were even neglecting communion with him. And that's why he ends with saying, I'm knocking at the door, and if you'll listen, I'll come in, and we'll restore it. I'll get you back on track, but you don't even have time for me. You're pulling your cart through life, and you're denying me time and place in your life through my word. Well, possession distraction was a theme of Christ's teaching. By the way, if you scan Christ's parables, Jesus taught 38 parables, parabolic stories, 38 of them. If you just scan them, just through your Bible, 16 of them are undoubtedly about money. They're about money. You know, the guy that built his barns too big, and the one that got one talent, and the one that got three, and the one that got five, and the one that got one and five and ten. It's all about money, 16 of them. That's just a cursory look. But if you take a closer look, in fact, theologians and people have spent their life actually counting the red words in the Bible. 
the, the, the words of Christ. And they count them and they measure them. And what they found out is that one out of seven or 15% of all Christ's teaching was about money. And I remember people used to say, wow, you go to church, all you hear is, you know, a sermon about, you know, money. Good thing they weren't alive back then. Every seventh word out of Christ's mouth was to do with money and possessions and not being possession distracted. Well, Jesus was making the invisible God's wishes and his expectations known to us as his children. And the summary of all Christ taught may be stated as, money is the monitor of our heart that reveals either we serve materialism, pleasure, the pursuit of things, or God. You can't do both. And it's amazing, in the 21st century, somehow thinks that though every other century couldn't do this, we can. And Jesus said, you can't. So I'd like to real briefly give you what I call Christ's simple guide to money. Let's turn back in our Bibles to, and I'm going to take you to Matthew 6. And we're just going to hit, I mean, one out of every seven words of of Christ were about money. But Matthew 6, I'm going to give you just seven of the words, okay? Just seven of the little times he taught. And just show you a little glimpse of what Jesus says about how we're, as believers, to relate to money. And as we go to Matthew 6 and all these others, I want you just to think about slipping in the back of the crowd and hearing Christ's message on money and possession and eternity and see what he communicated because he talked about it so much. Here's the first one. Matthew 6, 19 to 24, Jesus said, your money can't stay neutral. Either you're going to serve the money or serve God. You can't. You can't remain neutral with money. Either the money goes under God's total control or it controls us. That's what he says. It's too powerful. If you don't give it to me, it'll control you. If you surrender it to me, I control it. You can't. It's very, notice what he says, verse 19. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. There's going to be a constant stacking temptation. Don't do it. Verse 20, but lay up treasures in heaven. Verse 21, why should we do that, Jesus? Because where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so what should we do? Verse 24, remember, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. Here it is. You can't serve God and your money. So you got to realize that belongs to him anyway, because he bought us at a price. And therefore, we belong, and everything attached to us belongs to him. So number one, your money can't be neutral. Either you'll serve your money, or you'll serve God. Number two, chapter 25. Now, there we're skipping over a lot of his words, but look at Matthew 25. Here's a a very interesting insight Jesus gets. And it's kind of what we need to know right up front. Matthew 25, 18. Jesus said, never forget, your money already belongs to God. And you're just the steward. Now, that's the parable of the talents. Now, now listen to what it says in the 18th verse. You remember what the story is about? The master, that's Jesus, talks to these three, and he gives them something that they're supposed to use in their life, and at the end of their life, he's going to call them and account for it. Kind of like all of us, that that he created us, as it says in Ephesians 2.10, for a purpose. We were created for good works. And and he gave us everything we have in life as a stewardship. But look what it says in verse 18. But he who had received the one went and dug in the ground and hid, look what it says, New King James says, his Lord's money. The NIV says, his master's money. There's the essence of what Jesus was teaching. He said, it's not yours anyway. If you belong to me, everything you have belongs to me. Your children, Your career, your time, your money, your possessions, they're all mine. Jesus said, don't forget, your money already belongs to God. We're God's stewards. That's what the whole story is about. Now, Matthew goes on to Mark chapter 12. So the next book, go to the right, 12 chapters into that book. Look at chapter 12 of Mark, verse 43. And this is fascinating. This is now Jesus with his disciples, they parked by the treasury. That's where everybody gave. They didn't take collections in the service. They had this big receptacle. In fact, Josephus tells us they were a big like cornucopia, horns. They were brass, and they looked like a big funnel. And they went into this 
treasury of the temple. And all the people would go on pilgrimages and they would come up and, and they would bring sometimes literally wheelbarrows full of money. And they would park their wheelbarrow and they would start shoveling or they would hire someone to shovel into a metal container, a funnel, all this metal coinage. And it would just make uh, their accounts of, of how much money and how much sound and in in all this. And so this, Jesus parked his disciples and you know, he was sitting there watching and, you know, he told about how some blew horns so that nobody would miss their giving and they did all that. And then the crowd left and this little quiet older woman comes up with her hand and she just, as if it would make any sound, she sticks her hand in, opens it and scurries off. And Jesus, who knows all things, tells us she put in two leptons, the Greek word, lepton, which was a tiny, tiny, like a fish scale almost kind of coin. It was the very smallest coin of the ancient world. And she had two of them, widow's mites. You know, look what Jesus says in verse 43. He said, your giving must be proportionate to gain my favor. You know what he was saying? The people that made all the noise with the shovelfuls they could shovel all day and it wouldn't make a dent in what they had. They were doing that for the show. That woman gave everything she had. And that meant something to Christ. He said, to gain my favor, your giving has to be proportionate. Verse 43, so he called his disciples to himself and said to them, assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. Now, that statement could even be not just that day's, more than, I mean, it actually says all who have given. What Jesus was saying is, I measure by how much it costs you. Uh, turn the next book from Mark to Luke, chapter 6. There are two of them in the sixth chapter. And here's the fourth simple truth about uh, money Jesus gives in Luke 6, in verse 35. Jesus said, selfishness ruins giving. Now, it's a negative example. And, and what Jesus is saying is, uh, love your enemies, do good, and lend to your enemies. The context is, is a negative one. It's talking about people that don't like us. Now, it's even harder that way, but how much more are people that like us? But look what he says. Uh, love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Jesus said, selfishness ruins giving. If you hope, like it says in, in the book of James, if you, if you give money in the church, if you give enough, they're going to say, oh, come up here and sit in the good, you know, the good seats. You know, I, I can imagine this. I, I've, I've pastored enough years. I, I've listened to, uh, you know, the, the people that work the doors enough times. I've heard them. They said, did you see the car they drove in? I think that thing has heated handles. Look at this black. It's, oh, that's a big, whoa, wonder." When they were there going to sit, you know, and they just, people, we all are impressed by wealth. In the book of James, it says that they went beyond that. They put them down front because they were so crusty with gold. But the poor people that didn't have anything to give, they didn't even give them a chair. Jesus said, selfishness ruins giving. If you hope for something in return, you lose. But if you hope for nothing in return, if you selflessly give, look at the rest of verse 35, your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High because he's kind to the unthankful and the evil. How much more will he be to us who selflessly sacrifice to him? Now look at verse 38, same chapter, Luke 6, 38. Here's another one. Jesus said, always remember with me, giving is eternally compensated. You know, companies compensate you while you work for them. He says, I eternally compensate. And he says in verse 38, Give, and it will be given to you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, poured in your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He says, if you give, I'll eternally compensate you more than you can ever imagine. Uh, look at chapter 16. Here's another one. Luke 16 and verse 9. Now, this is a fascinating one. Jesus said, temporal treasures can always be exchanged for eternal wealth. And, and this is an interesting one. If you really think about it, the commentators are split, but I go with the side that believes he's talking positively. 
And this is what he says, verse 9. I say unto you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlast, an everlasting home. Now, I take that positively, an everlasting home. Jesus usually never joked about anything to do with eternity. Now, that's the New King James. Now, the NIV has it even clearer. This is what it says. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. In other words, in heaven. Why do I say that? Because when it is gone, your worldly wealth, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. You know what I can see? It's kind of like that thank you song that a lot of missionaries used to always play that music in the background when they were showing their slides. You know, thank you for giving to the Lord, and it showed all these poor people with their big smiles. That's on earth. Jesus was saying, in heaven, you're going to get to meet the people you helped, that you invested in, and they're going to invite you over to the room God made for them so you can talk about how great the Lord is and how he connected you through giving. Here's the last one. Look at Luke, or I mean, uh, Acts chapter 20. And then we've got to conclude. Acts chapter 20. By the way, this is amazing. This is a word of Christ that's not in the Gospels. Paul was inspired to tell us this word of Christ. And it says in chapter 20, verse 35, that Jesus loves and blesses givers. And Paul said, I've shown you in every way, Acts 20, 35, by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of, our, of the Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus said, I love givers and I bless givers. Now I'd like to conclude with this. What's our responsibility today? Last verse, go to 1 John, almost to Revelation again, but just before Revelation, 1 John chapter 3. This is probably the most important verse of all. So just go to the end and back up to 1 John 3, starting in verse 16. Because each of us that are believers have been given a stewardship by God of the time and treasures or money that we have in our oversight. God is watching each of us individually to see with what we do, with what he temporarily gave us to pull through life. We're going to hold on to it to the bitter end, or are we going to do something with it? And this is the, the 16th verse of 1 John 3 is amazing. And it shows how clearly our view of money reflects the control God has on us. This is what it says in verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So the context is believers and, and our responsibility to believers. Verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need. Now look at this and shuts his heart from him, looks away, doesn't want to know about the need, doesn't want to be bothered by that. Look at the next line. How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, here's the concluding thought. Are we rich and increased with goods, and becoming blind. In other words, are we insensitive to the poor? One way to jar us into thought about our stewardship is to think about all the people alive on earth today and how we relate to them. You know, it's comfortable to just think about Kalamazoo or Michigan, you know, or the United States, but we actually are part of a lot of other humans. And to make demographics easy, if we just reduce the whole world down to 1,000 people, this is what it would look like. 200 of them would be up in the balcony. We would be up in the balcony. That's called the developed world. 800 of the 1,000 would be living in the bottomlands down here. And the 1,000 people would be clearly split. 20% developed economic countries, 80% undeveloped poor countries. The high hill called the economically developed world is the balcony and the 800 on the rocky bottom land are the rest of the world. And we, the fortunate people on the hill in the balcony, hold 80% of all the wealth of everybody. So 80% is in the balcony and the other 20% is spread between 800 people. Now what does that mean? The balcony owns half of all the homes in town. Our homes average two rooms per person. 
We have 85% of the cars, 80% of the TVs, 90% of all the telephones, and everybody in the balcony makes an average income of $20,000 per person per year. That's the developed world. 20%, 1.2 billion people control 80% of everything. The not-so-fortunate 800 in the bottom lands. Most of the people down on the flatlands get only $700 per person per year. But many of them live on less than a dollar a day, which is less than $350 a year. What's the difference between $350 and $20,000? It's a 70 times differential. 70 times more annual income up there than down here of most people. Many of those average five people to a room. I, I'll never forget in Honduras, we were visiting the people that they minister to. We went to see a house. It was no bigger than the carpeted area. But it wasn't crowded at all because there were about 15 people running around outside, some taking care of the goats and some of the chickens and some cooking on the fire outside. But finally, at the end of the visit, I said, well, because it was starting to rain, I said, well, where does everybody sleep? And they said, look up. And it looked like cobwebs. There were so many hammocks. Every one of them had a hammock. And they strung them up all through underneath this little tiny area. And you know what? That's what the undeveloped world is like. An average of five people per room. And how did the people on the balcony use their incredible wealth? Well, as a group, they spend less than 1% of their income aiding any of the poor people. In fact, in the United States in 2012, Forbes magazine said this, that of every 100 we earn in income, $33 we spend on our house, $17 goes for our food, more than half of which we eat out because we have so much money, we don't even need to make it ourselves, which would be cheaper. We're going to have someone else make it for us, you know, so we can sit and be served. And $7 in health care, but I can promise you that's going to go up. And $15 on transportation, $4 on recreation. By the way, Forbes mentions that if we only cut out our 4% of recreation and amusement, it would meet every medical need of the 80% of the world. That's how much money we have. But we need to be recreated and nascar and movied. And $3 we spend on clothes, and about $2 is given to charitable uses. But only a tiny part of that ever leaves America. Now the question is, I wonder how the villagers down on the crowded plain a third of which are suffering from malnutrition, feel about the people who live up there. You see why they stick their arms in the window when they see one of us? Hoping it'll elicit a response. Now look back before we go at 1 John 3, and here's what the Lord said. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. He gave himself for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now you notice this is... Just in the 80% of the people on the flatland, if nothing else, Jesus is saying, verse 17, if you have this world's goods and you see a believer in that undeveloped 80% of the world living down there on less than a dollar a day and you shut your heart from them, how does the love of God abide in him? Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. You so loved us in our spiritual bankruptcy and poverty and the decay of our souls that you gave yourself to come into this world and to die in our place. And that love should constrain us to give back to you the control, not only of our body, but of everything connected to us in life, and to reflect your love by our actions. I pray that we would flee anything that nauseates you, and that you would not see us being controlled by our possessions, but rather systematically bringing everything under your Lordship, O oh, Master, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask this. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you as you go.